All right, welcome to our motor circuit protection, motor applications and circuit pro and motor circuit protection uh, discussion. I appreciate everybody dialing in. We've got a full house on WebEx again. We've got a full house on uh, YouTube. It's building up strong. And um, appreciate everybody uh, and everybody's participation and engagement. Please remember to use the chat sessions, the chat uh, dialogue, both on YouTube and uh, and on uh, WebEx. All right, so. Uh, as, as usual, everybody who is on WebEx is muted. Those who are on YouTube are uh, already muted. Um, I don't have to worry about you guys and gals, but those who are on WebEx, please uh, you know, be mindful of that little microphone of yours. Um, mute yourself. Makes everybody's life much better. Uh, although I am on uh, committees, I, I, I'm speaking on my behalf. I'm not speaking on behalf of anybody else. Anything I say is my opinion and my opinion only. Um, I look forward to feedback and discussion. Um, challenge me and questions and anything I can't answer, I will get an answer to and put that out there. So, uh, but if I can answer it, I will do that. All right, so we're talking electric motors. And before I get into this, I forgot to put my little slide and nobody reminded me. At least I don't think anybody reminded me. We're gonna take a look at the quiz. This will be uh, fun, I think. Let's see how many people we got responding and we'll see what the uh, 168 respondents, which is kind of cool, it's a good thing. Motor nameplate. So the first question is, motor nameplate full load amps is used to establish conductor ampacity through multiplication factors. True or false? You had a 50-50 chance, but then I threw in the not shores. Thanks for the eight that were honest. That was a good thing. I appreciate that. Um, and it looks like people are still voting. 105, 59, we've got 173, 174. All you have to do to vote on this one is to, uh, is to put 84, 44, 53. Go to menti, M-E-N-T-I dot com. And I would say uh, maybe what we should do one day is uh, if... We could just say, look, whoever gets, whoever, whatever true or false gets the most votes, that's where they're going to be the right answer. But unfortunately, I can't do that. And uh, we will walk through this to help you guys help all 114 or 116 now. That seems that true column is growing. But unfortunately, if you're in that true column, you're not right. I apologize uh, for, I don't know. But um, the issue there is that we don't use the motor nameplate full load amps to establish the conductor ampacity. We use the tables in, uh, in the National Electrical Code, uh, which, which based on, it's based on horsepower. Uh, I'm going to try to find the table here real quick. Nothing's real quick in the in this uh in this book 430.247 full load current in amperes that's for direct current motors it goes by horsepower and then uh 248 is single phase ac motors 249 is full load current for for two phase and, and then 250 is your full load current for three phase alternating current motors we size conductors and overloads and a few other items to um based upon the tables not the nameplate full load amps that are marked so the answer to this one is false um we, we're going to be using the tables and we'll go over that in detail um, if you can't hear me I, I know i know others can hear me if you can't hear me on the uh, on this uh, system then um i would either you can redial in go check it out on youtube uh, however you want to do that, play them on both. But the right answer on this one is false. So 68 of you, great job. Stand up. Pat yourself on the back. You did good. All right. Let's go to the next one. Tables, 430, 247 through 430, 250. Those were the tables I was just reading from. Those are the tables that we use to calculate uh, such things as overloads, etc. 
I'm sorry, not overload. Uh, we use those tables for sizing conductors and short circuit protection and ground fault protection. I was just reading it. So this one says tables 430, 247 through 250 are used to determine overload protection size. 91 said true, 56 said false, 34 not sure. Love all 34 of you. The 56 are right. So um, we do not use those tables to determine the overload protection. We use the nameplate full load amps to determine the overload protection. So uh, we've got some learning to do and some explaining to do, but we're going to cover that. So 58, great job. 93, that's why I'm doing this program. It's for you and those 35 others. 188 voters, look at that. Once they know the right answer, they jump on. But you know what? The guys on gals on YouTube are about a two-minute delay or maybe a minute delay. I'm not sure. So um, that's interesting that, uh, you know, the WebEx guys are getting a little bit quicker. That's why we're seeing some of these float in. All right, next question. Motor nameplate current rating full load amps is used to determine short circuit and ground fault protection. And we have 111 false and 54 true. Boy, well, you know what? The, the, the tides are changing. That's a good thing because now I'm feeling more comfortable. The right answer outweighs the wrong answer. Um, so that's a good thing. That 111 is, is correct. That we use... Um, actually, no. Yeah, we don't use. That's right. It's false. The, the 113 now is, is the right column to be in. Um, and we do not use the nameplate current rating for short circuit and ground fault protection. We use the uh, tables. Uh, and, and one of the reasons for that, you got to remember that I could have a motor that's a higher efficiency motor, or I could have a specific motor. Um, I would say, for example, I would want to... Uh, uh, the, the full load amps of, of a specific motor might be a little bit lower than what this, uh, another full load amp uh, motor, another motor's full load amps would be. So basically, we size the overloads, we size the conductors, we size the short circuit protection based upon, not the overloads, we size the conductors and we size the short circuit protection, the ground fault protection, the starter, you know, the contactor, things like that. Uh, to the tables so that in case we change out motors and things like that, uh, we still have this, the right level of short circuit protection. We have the right uh, contact and, uh, contactors, etc. cetera. Uh, but the overload protection will change by motor because the full load amps is going to probably change by motor, uh, be it for a lot of different reasons. One motor's full load amps may be a lot different than another because of efficiencies and a lot of other uh, little details. Uh, so in any case, um, that's sort of, uh, of some logic. Hopefully that that helps you understand uh, why we use one, the tables versus the nameplate. And we'll get into more of that as we go through this, uh, this whole program. But it's, it's good to see that, um, you know, I usually try to use these quizzes to help me judge the audience. And if everything, if everybody was getting everything right, then... I wouldn't need to do the program because you all know a lot of these little details. Uh, but it, obviously, we, we're going to need we're going to have some work to do. Now, this is an interesting one. Um, uh, maximum size dual element fuse. What size? What's maximum? So I said maximum. I like to use the maximum because there's a couple reasons behind that. One, it's easy. I mean, I, if I if if I do if I did a quiz and I just said what would you put because you could put a wide range. There's a lot of right answers in there. But a lot of times when you say maximum, that keys in whether or not you can go to the next size up, right? So we learned that yesterday on transformers, the tra maximum transformer primary overcurrent protective device size for the transformer the example that we had, uh, we had, uh, it's 250%. But when you use 250%, you can't go to the next size higher. You have to step down to the next size lower. Uh, if it's not right on a, a standard ampere rating for an overcurrent protective device. Um, 
So, and, and usually, and, and a lot of people forget that fact, and it could be just because nobody usually sizes it at the maximum, I don't know. But, but in any case, that's a little tiny detail, and it makes the quiz question a little bit easier. So what you would have to do to size a dual element fuse uh, for a 100 horsepower AC uh, polyphase motor, and I put those words in there specifically uh, because um, that's the way these tables are worked out. The first thing you'd have to do is go to 430.250 for because it's um, polyphase, so it's uh, the full load current for a three-phase alternating current motor. So 430.250 tells me a 100 horsepower motor uh, at 460. Did I, yeah, I gave you the voltage, which is an important. So you need voltage and you need horsepower to figure this stuff out. That's um, <laughs> dual, not dual. <laughs> yeah, it depends on uh, which way you look at it, uh, uh, Ron. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, dual, D-U-A-L. Thank you for that. Uh, 460 volts. Um, so synchronous squirrel cage hold on induction full of current three phase polyphase bcd locked rotor currents just looking for the right table i believe it's 200 amps but i gotta see how i got there what did i say 100 horsepower Well, version table, single phase, full load current for a 100 horsepower motor for 240, 260. Well, I had it as 200 amps, but when I'm reading this table, it doesn't sound, doesn't, doesn't sound good. I don't think I read, read the wrong column. It should probably be around 100, 100 amps, but none of those answers are, uh, are there. Well, I'm, I'm using it as an example, so we'll go through... Ah, you know what? Okay, so I got to take the 124. So 100 horsepower AC polyphase motor, 124 amps. Let's do the math. 124 amps is the full load amps. Then I got to go to table 430.52. Dual element, D-U-A-L, not D-U-E-L. I got to multiply that by 1.75 based upon 430.52. 1.75 times that gives me 217 i can't go to the next higher so i gotta rack that down so 200 amps would be uh would be my uh my right numbers cool all right perfect so i used 430-250 and we're going to walk through this detail 430-250 to get the full load amps 100 horsepower at 460 volts was 124. Then I take 430.52, maximum rating or setting of motor brand circuit, and I multiply, uh, because I have a dual element, uh, dual, D-U-A-L, element time delay fuse, I'm using 175% for an AC polyphase motor. Uh, and that's how you get to that number. So 200 amps, those 55, doing a good job. Okay, motor circuit protector is a thermomagnetic circuit breaker sized based on the horsepower and for motor protection. 67 true, 85 false. The false is the right answer because a motor circuit protector is not a thermomagnetic circuit breaker. Uh, thermal, uh, a motor circuit protector does not have a thermal curve associated with it. It has an instantaneous and we'll show you the curves for this, but there is no thermal, so you can't use it as a branch circuit type device. Uh, it is only used uh, in motor circuit uh, scenarios. It's a, it's a recognized component that's for use in that application as a part of an overall scheme. So we're gonna talk about that. So 92 of you got it right. The 67, 77 of you, um, Thanks for trying, and uh, we're going to give you those details as we move forward. A motor service factor establishes how frequently a motor is run for use in load calculations. No, not quite right. So 89 of you got that one right. 62 of you did not. Uh, that is a false uh, statement. Uh, the reason is, and we're going to cover service factor. Service factor, basically, if I have a motor... Um, 
that is like say a 1.15 115 uh, percent 1.15 uh, service factor that means i can uh, i can push that uh, i can increase the horsepower the driving on that that's coming out of that motor from the shaft uh, to a 15 percent or 1.15 times that horsepower and we're going to cover that in detail or, or we're going to go over that for you to help you understand that. But it does not mean it doesn't have anything to do about frequencies or frequent uh, uh, starting or anything like that. Uh, it is uh, basically I can increase the horsepower of that motor by 1.15 or whatever that service factor is. All right. So 100 of you got that right. The short circuit current rating of a circuit breaker is often less than the same rating of a fuse. I love this question. I, you know, this, and I throw this in, especially in this one here, because, I mean, we're talking motors, we're talking uh, motor starters and things like that. But uh, it's important to remember that a circuit breaker and a fuse do not have a short circuit current rating. They have an interrupting rating. So the right answer to this is false. And the primary reason is because overcurrent devices are rated based upon an interrupting rating, not a short circuit current rating. I have equipment that is rated on a short circuit current rating perspective. So uh, one of these days I'm going to ask this question and I'm going to get a hundred percent true or a hundred percent right. And um, I won't have to discuss short circuit current ratings versus interrupting ratings anymore. But um, the answer to that is false. Type 1 protection is the best protection you can provide ensuring no damage to the starter. 44 trues, 53 false, 66 not trues, 53 false is the right answer. It's type 2 protection, which is the best protection you can provide ensuring no damage to the starter. Um, thanks for the 67. They're not sure that your know, honesty is important. Um, but uh, remember that uh, there's a type one and a type two type of equipment from a protection perspective. Type one, you can have damage. You you basically won't blow the doors open. You won't create a uh, shock hazard, etc. Type two protection, if you have a fault there, it's it it responds so fast. Uh, the overcurrent protection has to respond so fast that no damage occurs or limited to no damage occurs to the equipment. Obviously, you may have some damage, but uh, it won't. Uh, have catastrophic failure. So the right answer on that one is uh, 60 uh, is false. 64 if you got that one right. And we're, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. A little bit about that. The NEMA type motor often used for elevators. And I wasn't sure, I wouldn't think anybody would have got this one right. Um, unless you're really into elevators or really into motor types. Because motor types, uh, you know, your types A, B, C, and D, etc. Um, Aren't, uh, you know, a lot of people don't uh, know those types unless you're really a motor guy. So we have about 32 motor motor people here. Uh, yeah, that's what I say. Uh, go hydraulic. Uh, don't use a motor. Use hydraulics. And uh, I got to spell that one right, too. Uh, <laughs> I never said I was good spelling. So, and 84, not sure. So really, uh, we're going to look at these uh, start curves, uh, torque. And when you get into applications like elevators, et cetera, um, the uh, torque, uh, what a motor can deliver with regard to torque is some of them is the driving factor for why you would pick an A, B, C, or D. For an elevator application, we would pick a type D uh, motor and we'll talk and we'll show the start curves for each of these to help you understand the, the torque uh, associated with those types of motors. All right. I will fix a couple spelling errors in there and uh, later so that uh, we don't have to worry about that in the future. That was done last night. All righty. So let's get, into, uh, let's get into the program on electric motors. What is an electric motor? Uh, you know, the key thing to remember about motors, I mean, you think we had, to, we had a transformer discussion yesterday. And what we learned in the transformer discussion is that you have um, you have magnetic flux? You have uh, you know AC currents you know, do a lot for us with regard to things like transformers and motors. And when we energize a coil around some iron, we can do some magic. Uh, and if I have um, 
if I if I do this in a transformer, obviously I, we talked about it yesterday. I can I can take voltage from one voltage to another, current from one current to another, increase and decrease voltages on either side of that transformer from induced currents and things like that through magnetic flux and whatnot. Well, I can do something similar on motors, and I can turn a shaft based upon a stator and a rotor, uh, and and how I configure those and from magnetization and things of that nature. Um, I can turn a shaft. So uh, what we do know is that, you know, 64% of all the power generated in the U.S. is consumed by motors. Uh, it, it, George Westinghouse, Nikolai Tesla, this goes back in the day, uh, were fans of AC power because of the things that we can do with it quite easily. We can transmit, we can uh, use transformers to take from one voltage to another. Although, you know, the DC stuff is coming along well these days. Uh, but uh, there's things I can do with AC that I can't necessarily, or I can do, but a little bit more difficult to do on the DC side of the world. Uh, it's uh, it, Motors are everywhere. I mean, you have motors in your refrigerator, motors in, um, in, in hair dryers, motors uh, at utilities. There's motors everywhere uh, all around us. And, and it's a very, just like transformers, very important part of our power distribution system. So if you look at the construction of a motor, you have stator, you have rotor, you have the enclosure holding it all together. And then uh, another part of this all is the insulation, which we'll talk about uh, the insulated uh, parts and pieces that because uh, temperature is the is the worst enemy for electric motors, just like it is for most people and myself. Um, uh, so, you know, elevated temperatures for long periods of time, breaks down, uh, impedance, etc. So uh, these are the different types of parts that you'll find from a motor's perspective. You'll notice uh, in the back there uh, of, this, uh, of this equipment, there's a fan over here in the back. Let me just do this. You know, there's a, there's a fan back there, and that that's, that's, uh, serves a purpose. Those fins serve a purpose. The reason we have all of these these fins on this motor it's it's helping dissipate heat he, you know heat is is it, it's not good for breakers it's not good for fuses it's not good for electrical equipment you know we struggle to get the heat out literally uh, and when you see motors that have that are constructed in this way with all the fins and that built-in fan that's uh, taking advantage of that uh, that rotor that's that's turning uh, is all there to help uh, decrease the the impact of heat in that equipment or on that device. So the stator is the stationary part of the motor uh, that basically we wire things to. You know, we will uh, put 480 volts or whatnot on on the stator, and uh, and based upon how many phases that we have in there, uh, we will. It helps generate that uh, that um, what do you call it the the rotating fields that will help turn the shaft. So uh, they're they're insulated. They're made from uh, silicone steel. It's it's very similar. If you think about it, it's 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 similar to the principles of transformers. Motors and transformers and generators are very well related to each other. Uh, even in the mathematical equations, uh, from an engineering perspective, a lot of our uh, mathematical equations will account for that will be similar between all of these products because they use similar principles. You know, there's windings that are uh, wound in and around those coils. They're insulated, um, and uh, you know they're stacked. They, 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 we keep them insulated from each other with uh, with laminations and whatnot, and and uh, we basically energize the the stator, connect it directly to the power source, often 480. You know, but we have motors and a lot of different uh, applications. We in in single phase, we'll use sometimes uh, we'll use capacitor starts. We'll there's DC motors. A lot of this stuff works uh, works in similar manner. You have the rotor, which is that rotating part of the uh, of the of the device of the equipment. Uh, again, what you'll do is you have a you have a, we have a really good dem demonstration up at our experience center in Pittsburgh, where we take a um, you just have that stator and they they put a field electrify that with a three phase uh, circuit and you can see the fields inside there by using a, 
a magnetic uh, tool uh, that will light and you'll see that rotation. But uh, you have that AC sine wave displaced from each other uh, because you're using A, B, and C phases and they're out of, phase, out of phase with each other uh, by a certain degrees and, and that will help rotate that rotor um, because of the magnetic pull. You know, it, the, the rotor doesn't have coils of wire uh, like you would have on the stator. Uh, and again, it's, it's connected with end rings completing that circuit. And again, it, uh, it, it's, the, it's the magnetic fields that turn that rotor. Now the enclosure puts it all together. And again, we talked about the fins that are associated with that. You know, it, it's going to be there. It, the the enclosure is there to protect uh, the components inside, provide a structure to hold everything together. Um, it's uh, it's insulated from everything, all the all the different parts inside, but it's there to provide that housing, so to speak. Prevents provides the protection for the the environment that that I'm going to place this motor in, whether it's outside, inside. It, it obviously because of the fins that you see there it provides some cooling to help dissipate the heat that's generated we've got bearings in there we've got to think about um uh, there's a you know as you as you look at the construction of a motor you got to think about uh the failure parts and pieces and what would cause certain things to fail you know what would cause a bearing housing to fail or the bearings to fail that shaft to fail um, the 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 stator and the, the stator windings. What would cause that to fail? You're you're connecting the stator directly to a power source, so transient voltages could cause those stator windings to fail. Um, heat could cause the um, the uh, the insulation to break down and and eventually fail as they come in contact with each other, causing internal short circuits. Bearings, you know, heat and uh, misalignment of that shaft. Uh, you know, putting torque on that shaft in a way it's not meant to be could uh, could hurt your bearings and cause heat in the bearings and, and the bearings could fail, which could cause other catastrophic failures inside of that piece of equipment. So as you, it's important to understand the construction of these devices because it helps us understand uh, our protection. Uh, so the other accessory that we have, so, you know, as we said, heat is a... Uh, Heat is ungood for motors, as it is for transformers, as it is for most electrical equipment and those who work on electrical equipment. Um, so some of the sometimes you'll have motors that will have RTDs, uh, resistance temperature detectors. And uh, as I increase the uh, the temperature around this, I'll change the resistance of this component and I can detect uh, the temperature and relate that to a temperature rise inside of the uh, the equipment and uh, and i will monitor these rtds with relays and overcurrent protective devices that are equipped to handle that and then i can make uh, a a call based upon set points and and what i'm reading from this temperature sensor to tell that to, to tell the overcurrent device when to open or relay or whatever it is contactor so uh, based upon the uh, the temperature exceeding certain temperature limitations within that motor. You won't see these on small motors. You're going to see these on large motors or larger motors. Uh, you know, obviously, when you get into protection, the amount of money that you spend on that motor is probably going to be dictate the level of protection and options that you use to protect that motor. Um, so, the uh, you know, the the RTD... Is, a, is an important tool in the protection engineer's basket. We use RTDs in transformers as well. So, you know, in other items, there are, there are other areas and other types of electrical equipment where we will leverage these uh, resistance temperature detectors. Thermistors, uh, again, another, another way to detect uh, the, the temperature, higher precision with limited range. So, Again, uh, we'll use these types of uh, devices the, for different types of motors and different types of applications and more critical motors. You know, watching the temperature rise. Temperature will rise in a motor for a lot of different reasons. It might, might not just be because of imbalance or uh, a problem inside. It could be because of uh, wear and tear on bearings, etc. There's a lot of different reasons 
for the temperature of that motor to rise. Uh, and using these types of accessories can help uh, detect uh, that failure or that there is a problem. Uh, thermocouples, wide range of, uh, of, of sensing. Again, you have two dissimilar metals so, and, uh, and, and they're placed in different places in and around that, um, that uh, e equipment. All used at sensing heat. Uh, bearing and winding heaters, uh, again, uh, so you know, you, what you don't want to do is take a motor out of service and have condensation uh, on those critical parts like bearings and whatnot, depending upon the environments that you're in. So there are heater elements that when that motor is not running, you can uh, provide the heat that the motor would normally have and keep those critical components uh, uh, nice, roasty, toasty, warm, and dry. Um, so those are, you know, again, other accessories that you may have on a motor. And again, the larger the motor, the more complicated the, the schemes and the different types of motors as well. There's, uh, there's, there's certain types of motors where I can actually have access to uh, other parts of internal wiring within that motor where I can put sensors and whatnot. Um, again, driven by the type of motor that I'm, that I'm employing. Uh, so what I did was um, I uh, w went on a mad search for a nameplate and some information out there, and I found a Baldor or a Baldor. I don't know how to pronounce that word, but I don't know if it's Baldor. I've always said Baldor, but for some reason, I just dawned in my head to say Baldor. I don't know. Baldor motor or Reliance. There, that's an easier word. Uh, so I found a, uh, a Reliance motor uh, with a nameplate and some other information. And what basically what I want to do is just walk through like we did yesterday on transformers. We, we walked through a protection, uh, of, uh, of the transformer. And I'm going to do the same thing on this one to help, uh, uh, just walk through the, how we, how we pick the overcurrent protective devices. We're, we're going to, we're going to basically, uh, walk through the, the overload, the circuit conductor, minimum, uh, circuit conductor size, the uh, overload size, the disconnecting means, all of the, these are the different sections within the National Electrical Code that we are going to talk about with regard to this 100 horsepower motor. The nice thing about this was I was able to find, now this isn't a lot, for a 100 horsepower motor, I think this is a, a pretty good wealth of information that you have. There is some data missing out of this uh but i do uh, i do have some other uh, for some larger um, medium voltage motors i will show you some more additional information that you can uh, get from the manufacturer of those motors to gives you a better way to represent the start curve and damage curve for a motor to understand maximum protection but you'll notice there's a lot of information we've got rated output horsepower that's right there at the shaft uh, we've got the voltage, and you'll notice there's a 230 and a 460 volt uh, uh, rating, and there's also two versions of full full load amps. So I could use this motor uh, on based on two different voltages, which is kind of cool. So a very versatile mo motor from Reliant. Uh, it tells me my frequency, my phase, my KVA code, my NEMA design code. We're going to talk about uh, and and there's that service factor. So this is a 15 1.15 service factor. We're going to talk about. A lot of what you see here uh, on this uh, additional information that's available on this specific 100 horsepower motor. Uh, look at the uh, the load characteristics down there on the bottom. You have uh, the percent rated load, and it shows you the power factor based upon the uh, on whether you're at 50 percent rate uh, loading or 100 percent loading. So it's and one of our discussion points in this session which I've only got two hours, so I can't really get into a lot of detail on everything, but you know, motors are, are, are complicated devices and, and sizing the motor to the loads to understand the load torque uh, that's needed, the, 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 the torque that's needed to start a load and keep that load running and, and comparing that to the torque uh, capabilities of, of each of these motors uh, as you get to the different types of applications. So, it shows you that, you know, if I'm only running that uh, at 50% of rated load, I have a worse power factor uh, than if I run that at 100%. I got 83.83, 83% power factor. So, um, you know, that's 
obviously the closer I get to unity, the better off I am, but you don't want to be right there at unity. Uh, my efficiencies also will be impacted based upon how I load this motor. Uh, the speed, uh, the speed will be impacted in my line amps that I'm drawing. So uh, again, you know, what's nice about uh, some of these motors, again, the large, the larger motors, you'll get information like this. The small motors, you'll probably have a harder time getting this, uh, the detailed information. It's just like transformers, and we talk, we had the same discussion yesterday in transformers that that uh, you know I can give you a lot of information on this on those really big five thousand kVA transformers or bigger. You'll get you'll get a lot of detailed engineering data from the manufacturer of those transformers. You're not going to get much uh, of that same type of data on the really really small ones. Now there are five major parameters that define motor performance: horsepower, torque, speed, starting or peak current, and temperature rise. You know all of those work together to give you the picture of the performance of that motor. Uh, so that's just an important uh, uh, important thing to uh, to remember that each of those. And we're going to talk about uh, we're, we're going to talk about a lot of those uh, components. Each of those, pretty much, we're going to hit each one of those. I believe. I put this uh, slide deck together a while ago, so um, sometimes it's hard to remember where, <laughs> where you were. So uh, horsepower, the rate of doing work. It's the amount of work that's done, and it's the amount of uh, of uh, the, it's the capability of that motor at its at its shaft. Um, so horsepower is defined in in if you look at you know consider we talked about those five parameters on the previous slide torque and speed uh, help you determine the horsepower uh, output and the equation for that is torque times two times pi and i couldn't find out couldn't figure out in in microsoft powerpoint how to get that pi symbol uh, but in any case uh, and times the speed over thirty-three thousand. and if you uh, work that down you'll get torque times speed over 52 52 that's uh, probably a an equation that you are more familiar with and it's right down there on the bottom uh, underneath the picture of the horse, <laughs> giving you uh, giving you the horsepower. Um, so in any case, uh, we we here in the U.S. we rate motors in terms of horsepower, uh, but outside of the U.S. they rate those uh, in kilowatts. So it's basically how much work is done out of the shaft of the motor. It's not an electrical parameter; it's a physical parameter. A lot of people get that confused. Now, service factor is a number that's multiplied by the horsepower, telling you uh, what you can do uh, for uh, on a continuous basis. So remember, service fa service factor is you know, I'm increasing the horsepower, and I'm operating that motor at that higher level of horsepower continuously, and that takes into consideration temperature rise and temperature increases because of uh, because of the um, of that uh, additional, you know, again, I'm putting an additional load on it. I'm just going to do something real quick here. Okay. I'm just looking up at some of the comments up here. Type D, excellent, John Clements. All right, so, so service factor, again, if I have something at 1.15 service factor, that means I take the horse, horsepower, I multiply that by 1.15, that means I can, and remember, horsepower is at the shaft, out of the shaft of that motor, what I'm driving. Um, we can multiply that by uh, the horsepower by 1.15. And that, that doesn't necessarily, tran no, it doesn't translate into the full load amps. You don't multiply. I've never seen that multiplied uh, by the full load amps. Um, I know we use surface factor uh, in the tables uh, and in, in sizing the devices, you'll see as we walk through this example where 1.15 comes into play. But we don't use that 1.15 when we're determining, well, we do uh, to a point. Uh, there's a multiplier. Again, we'll get into the details of how we use that 1.15 as we move through sizing of the overloads and overcurrent devices. Um, let's see what else provides insurance against uh, adverse conditions. Again, uh, you know, you may plan to run this thing at its uh, standard horsepower, but you may need more um, horsepower for whatever reason temporarily, and this just gives you that that additional uh, 
that additional uh, um, comfort level. I call it like insurance. Now, uh, there are, and I, and I had, uh, there were a bunch of slides in here talking about all of the ways that you would have to derate motors. Uh, I mean, everywhere from the elevation, you know, if you're in Denver, Colorado, and you're up there on the mountains, you're using motors above a certain elevation, you may have to derate the, the capabilities of that device. Voltage, if you're operating it at a lower voltage, you're, you're going to impact the full load amps, you're going to impact the torque. Um, if you operate it at a different um, at a different frequency, you're going to impact the capabilities of these devices. So, um, so those that whole application of voltage, uh, you know, th there's a lot of different parameters that will impact the performance of that. And I like this uh, uh, NEMA. You know, NEMA allows a plus or minus ten percent on standard voltages, uh, but this sort of shows you that percent voltage variation, it'll impact the full load amps, the starting amps, um, and the efficiency and power factor of a motor. Uh, but again, you know, um, uh, just trying to think of uh, some of the other areas. Uh, bear with me here a second. Uh, but motor... Um, the, the temperature that you're running that thing in, the elevation that you're at, uh, all of that uh, impacts uh, the, the performance of that motor. So I just sort of honed in on, um, uh, I honed in on, on the voltage, uh, but, and, and, and depending on how you, you know, if you're running something at a lower value, you could impact the, um, the temperature rating, which will impact the life of, of that motor um, and there are a lot of detailed like I say there's uh, there are a lot of of different uh, um, uh, there are a lot of different uh, um, resources that you could go into a, a much more depth in association with with uh, how you derate motors and the impact to the life of a motor etc but uh, those are your those are those are just some examples. Voltage is a is a big one, I think. And 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 ways to fix that. So if you have lower voltage, sometimes uh, you do local power factor correction can help increase the voltage at those motors. So there's ways to address that. And 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 understanding uh, those the understanding those things that can that that will require you to derate a motor will help you understand some of the protection capabilities or things that you need to employ to help provide a protection well and beyond national electrical code requirements, right? You're, you, you're going to look at that motor, depending on how much you spent on it, it's an investment. There's some bare minimum code requirements that you do for, for overcurrent protection, ground fault protection, and things of that nature. But if you've spent a lot of money on that motor, you're going to probably do go above and beyond what the code is telling you and, um, and, and do more protection, provide more areas of protection to uh, to increase the life of the of that tool you you have that that resource capital expenditure. Uh, so the efficiency is the percentage of energy that you supply to that motor motor, and what's translated on the output from that shaft on what you're driving. So again, um, you know, and efficiencies of motors have gone up. Uh, just like transformers, efficiencies of transformers are going up, have gone up. There's a, there's a desire to make things more efficient for energy use reduction, um, uh, for, from a savings for, for, for the bottom line on how much power, how much, how much you're paying to, to turn that rotor, uh, how much you're paying to energize that transformer or, or lights, things are getting more efficient for, from a cost perspective. Uh, we use variable frequency drives to help uh, save off of that huge inrush of current to minimize that impact to the rest of the power distribution system as well. Because you got to remember, especially when you get into large motors, you start you start a large motor on your power distribution system. It's going to lower the voltage uh, on, across the board uh, to get that motor up and running, and that could have an impact, a negative impact, depending upon how much you have to, you have to lower that voltage on the system to get that motor started. Uh, and how often you're maybe starting two or three motors at the exact same time. So there's ways to address 
the the voltage dips and 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 motor efficiencies and things like that are all part of the overall picture and performance of not just the motor but also the entire power distribution system as it functions all right so let's talk a little bit about torque uh i mean you know that motor is going to turn something now this specific 100 horsepower motor is a NEMA design b motor which tells us a lot uh because uh, it tells us where you would typically, if you understand what the, the torque curve for a NEMA uh, design B, which we're going to talk about that, uh, then you'll understand the, um, you'll understand what kind of loads you can drive with this motor. A type B motor is very common for pumps, blowers. I, I, I think, in my opinion, um, I'd love to hear other people's opinion on this, but um, um, the the type B motor is probably the most prevalent, common uh, motor that you see in the industry. Uh, so in torque, now you know if you if you've done ever ever done any work with using wrenches and things like that, or I know I had lug nuts uh, uh, locked in. Apparently, the the person who changed my tires at the uh, not at the dealership, it was a just up the road from where I live, he got a new air compressor in. And, and anytime you take a vehicle in, if you see them using the air hammer on your, uh, the air wrench on your lug nuts, you know, you tell them don't do that. Um, they should just use the, the, the star wrench or regular wrenches because I had, I know my lug nuts were so tight, I had to put a cheater bar. And I'm doing basically what you're seeing in that bottom image there. If I have, a, if I put a cheater on that uh, on that wrench, the further out I get, the more torque I can I can put on where that bolt is. And if you think about where a motor is located, it the motor doesn't have the advantage of a cheater bar because it's right there at that shaft. Uh, so your 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 radius is is like nothing. So because uh, you're right there at that shaft so your torque it's you can't take advantage of of uh of, of cheating you can't cheat with motors uh, but in any case this is a this is your like your speed versus torque curve this is a curve that you would typically see associated with various types of motors and you can request these types of curves and again you'll probably have a better chance at getting these for your large motors than you will have for the really small motors. Uh, but uh, uh, this shows you based upon, this is your speed versus torque. So you have your synchronous speed in percentage and you have your torque in percentage. And it shows you that from zero to 100% of your speed, you're going to have a certain range of torque and different uh, types of uh, NEMA types will give you a different profile. Some motors will have a lot of torque when you first power it up and then it tails off. Others like this one, they have, they'll peak at a torque value at a, at once it gets up to a sp certain speed. You're, you're seeing terms here, starting torque, pull up torque, breakdown torque. And, and what I mean by those, your, your breakaway torque is, um, is the torque that's, uh, that, that is required to start that shaft turning now this is the load side so you got to think about it you have the profile for the motor but then you've got to understand what the it, what it is you're driving with this motor the torque profile for say a conveyor belt is going to be much different than the torque load profile that you would have for say a fan uh, if you have a conveyor belt that's going to be typically constantly loaded, the breakaway torque value is going to be much higher than, say, a fan, which has no friction, no force against it outside of just the, the wind force and maybe the size of the blades to get it to get that shaft turning. So and if I'm standing on that conveyor belt, uh, I'll probably uh, add a little bit more weight to that that uh, will cause it cause you more torque being necessary to get that load starting to turn. So breakaway torque is an important aspect uh, from, a, from marrying a motor with the load. Accelerating or pull-up torque. So this tells you if I have a conveyor belt, so I, I use a conveyor belt because, you know, I think it's, I can visualize that. I have a conveyor belt that's loaded with coal or whatever it is. Uh, I can, I'll have the breakaway torque to get that conveyor belt moving. 
But once it'll take me a period of time to get that conveyor belt up to speed because now I'm I'm moving a weight. Uh, but if I have a fan, I can get that that uh, uh, that that fan uh, up to speed really fast because there's no there's no weight, no friction uh, that I'm that I'm trying to drive. Uh, then you have pull-in torque, and again, again, some of these are associated with. Um, uh, you have pull-in torque, importance when synchronous motor. So this is important for a synchronous type of motor. Some of these, like that that term specifically is associated with a synchronous motor. And then you have your maximum momentary torque that's a that that the uh, that a machine may require. So again, you're going to have a a motor starting curve, uh, or a, a motor you know torque to speed curve, and then you'll have the performance of the load. And what typically happens when you're when you when you're trying to pick the right motor for your application, you've got to make sure that uh, this is a process that's done up front before you've gotten into the pro process of sizing the overcurrent. Or whatnot, you're going to plot that uh, uh, start the, the what the load requires from a torque perspective, and versus what the motor can provide, and then make sure that you don't stall that motor. Or you, you may have a motor where you, your 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 locked rotor torque uh, is less than your load breakaway torque, and all you'll do is just let there sit there and watch that motor cook, right? So. Uh, you need <laughs> that's why they make torque sticks so you can uh, use the impact that's right so you just hit it with a hammer right get it moving but in any case so it what a, what a design engineer will do you're not going to do this on a lot of loads but you're going to do this as you get into uh, things like conveyor belts or other types of loads that where you're using the, the i guess your you know larger motors or whatnot um understanding uh, the the torque to speed and the requirements of the load are important to pick the right motor. So you'll have a uh, you'll have that motor curve, uh, and again, your NEMA B motors are are very common for fans, pumps, uh, again conveyor belts as well. Uh, depends on the application, right? And we 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 recognize that a Type D, which we'll look at those curves, are important for uh, what they use in elevators. So here's uh, again, I, and I showed you the one curve, which shows you both of those curves. But and what happens is the engineer is going to plot that you can have a constant torque, you can have a variable torque uh, load, a constant torque load, and you know, for example, that constant load uh, torque load number two. Uh, that's an example where your locked rotor torque uh, is less than your constant torque load uh, and you're not going to move that uh, that shaft it's it's not going to have enough uh, oomph to get it up to speed you're not going to get that uh, you're not going to get off of, off of uh, off of zero so um, in any case you know you have to do that comparison and that will also show you tell you how long it's going to take to get up to speed and we're going to help understand why that's an important parameter when we start picking over current protective devices so we use motors in a lot of different applications as you can see there. Uh, so Anima Design B, these are your, your four codes, A, B, C, and D. So you have, you'll, you'll see your percent uh, full load torque for a Design D at zero is, is greater than any one of those applications. So if you're moving something like an elevator you can, where you need a lot of torque in the beginning uh, and then tails off, that's why the Type D motor is, uh, is, uh, is a good choice for that application. Uh, your B, there's your A, B, and C, uh, but this is a type B motor, so that that green curve uh, is uh, is sort of is how is the profile for this motor. A and B motors, they're very similar, as you can tell. You'll see that uh, the A has a it rises to a higher uh, torque value than uh, the B does. So if your application needs that. Uh, I, I think, in my opinion, your your Type Bs are uh, are probably the most commonly used, uh, <clears throat> and there's some applications there uh, where where you uh, where you would see a B. A C has uh, has high locked rotor torque, so you have it's not quite as high as D. Uh, you'll see these on conveyors and compressors and reciprocating pumps, etc., uh, because you need that higher uh, torque value and that profile. Um, uh, 
and then you have your type uh, your type D again similar, but you know your A, B, and C have a have a nice, very similar profile from a torque perspective, but your type D you it, it it is much different because it it just tails off, uh, you know high peak loads, you know elevators, hoists, punch presses, that's where you're going to see your type D motors. All right, I'm just going to take a look at the chat here real quick. Um, I'm going to scroll up on the WebEx chat. I'm going to move this over to so the YouTube guys can see it. All right, so uh, so it looked like they had some WebEx uh, uh, sound issues. Rationale behind not using nameplate amps for conductor size. What's the rationale? I believe I talked about that, but we're going to talk about it a little bit more. Again, uh, for conductor size, you want to have the existing equipment in place for for any type of motor, regardless of the full load amps uh, that you're going to have, the efficiencies, et cetera, of that motor. So um, the infrastructure, which is your, your you're not going to be changing conductors out because one motor has a different full load amp than another, another motor, but the same horsepower rating. Uh, so we size based upon the NEC horsepower ratings and those full load amps, which is a conservative number, so that you have the hardware in place so that if you change out that motor, you're good to go. In case you swap out motors and the nameplate, uh, oh, so yes, Gunter, you uh, you answered that question. Thank you. Yeah, you change out the overload relays, but you wouldn't change out the wire and everything else. All right, thanks, Gunter. Uh, yep, dual, thanks for my spelling errors. Tom, please point out the table values are only used for motors less than 1,000 volts, even though 2,300 volt motors are currently shown. I have a public input for 2023 NEC to remove the 2,300 volt current since medium voltage motor protection must be performed under engineering supervision. Good point. Uh, who was that? Eddie. Yes, good point, Eddie. Thank you. Uh, that is true. So it's, you know, and, and, and from, a, from a National Electrical Code perspective, it's really important when you're when you're thumbing through the NEC, when you're looking at either a table or a section in the NEC, look at what parts, what like for example, 43052. 43052, so what uh, to, to, to point out the table values. I'm I'm just looking at 43052 because that's where it's open, but it's in part four, motor, branch circuit, and ground fault circuit protection. Uh, it's good to read the the very first section in each part, which will typically give you any of the general requirements or general uh, information. And, and a lot of times, uh, things like what uh, Eddie is pointing out, whether it's 1,000 volt and below or whatnot, is in that first section of, uh, of the code. Uh, the rules add to amended 240. I'm just looking to see if there's any... Part yeah so part part four so here it is so uh, so part four shall not apply to motor circuits rated over a thousand volts nominal so it tells you right at the beginning of that part so even though you're at four thirty whatever you know always always go up to the parent text so if you're at four thirty fifty two C five go look at what four thirty dot fifty two C applies to. And then understand what 430.52 applies to, and then take a look at what part it's in, and understand what that applies to, to really understand each section of the code and its requirement. Uh, so that's a good point, Eddie. Thanks for pointing that out. 200 amps is the answer. Yeah, good job. 175%. So yeah, I was just, uh, I was just navigating through the code. I didn't have it previously written down. Yes, breakers only have an interrupting rating. When a question asks maximum permitted, I take the exception, which permits exception 4, 430, 53C1, exception 1. So let's take it 430, 53. 430, 53 is several motors or loads on one branch circuit. Okay, so... Hey, Tom, that should have said 52. I mistyped. Ah, oh, oh that's you, Don. Okay. 430.52. I, I, uh, rating or setting. C1. 430.52. C1. In accordance with 430. A protective device that has a rating or setting not exceeding the value 
Exception number one, uh, where the values of branch circuit, short circuit, and ground fault protective devices determined by 430.52 do not correspond. Oh, excellent. Thermal protective devices or possible settings of adjustable circuit breakers or higher size rating or possible setting that does not exceed the next higher shall be permitted. So that was the exception I was looking for. It's not in the table. Usually that, that exception, so thanks for pointing that out, Don. Usually those exceptions are in the table like we do with transformers. We put that right at the bottom of the table, but here it's in 43052C1 exception. So I can go to the next higher one. Perfect. Thanks, Don, for pointing that out. Uh, so hydraulic. So, there, so I could use the next higher, and, and I'm going to use this example, and we will plot that and... Uh, and make those adjustments on the fly. There's the PDH code. Can we also say that service factor is the number we can multiply? I would not multiply that by full. We're gonna talk about that a little bit more as we get to show how the service factor is used. Uh, Baldor Motors was acquired by EBB. I'm not sure. Uh, Dove, Dove says yes. It happened to design e-motors. Oh, that's a good question, don't, uh, Wendell. I don't. I've not seen a design e motor. Um, that might be the higher efficiency stuff. I'd, I'll have to do some research on that one. Fork sticks e motors never happened. There you go. NEMA Design B high efficiency were developed instead. Good. Thanks, Wendell. I knew that it had something to do with efficiencies, and I couldn't remember why. Uh, but that's uh, they just came out with a design B high efficiency. All right. And someone give more examples of what other applications besides air compressors call for type C motors. Chime in. Anybody knows where uh, where you would use a type C motor other than a compressor, et cetera, the, where they would use a T, type C instead of a B. All right. I'm going to look on, uh, on YouTube, my tubers. I'm not sure how many people we got on YouTube. 376. That's pretty healthy. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, just looking at some this online from Murfreesboro. Awesome. Thank you, Don Ganeer. I'm not sure. Don's answering questions. He's the man. Nameplate full low current value is higher than the table values. Nameplate value be used. See, last sentence is A1. So Bob Fahey, good point. So Bob Fahey, if the nameplate full load current, so let's take a look at 430.6A1. 430.6A1. This is what I love about the code and I love about my tubers and and those on uh, things. So 6A1, 430.6 is ampacity and motor rating determination. A is general motor applications. So this applies, applies to all. And it tells you table values other than for motors built for low speeds or high torques and for multi-speed motors the values given in 430 247 248 249 and 250 shall be used to determine the impassive of conductors uh, blah 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 instead of the actual current rating on the motor name plate where a motor is marked in amperes but not horsepower the horsepower rating shall be assumed to be that corresponding to the value given in those tables motors built for low speeds high torques uh, may have higher, so motors built for low speeds, less than 1200 RPM, or higher torques may have higher full load currents, and multi-speed motors will have full load current varying with speed, and we know what happens with the speeds, right? So we're, cha we're usually changing frequency or something, or voltage, something to change speeds, uh, and, th and then that will impact the full load amps. In which case, the nameplate current ratings shall be used. So very good point um, that was raised by, by Bob Fahey. Thank you. Um, and and 430.6A1 gives you those conditions. And, and again, the reasons are, um, the reasons are that... Um, I just saw a note up here about D motors. Uh, the reason is because you're changing, you're either going to be changing frequency, you're going to be changing voltage, you're going to be changing one of those parameters to vary the volt, to vary the speed of that motor, which will change your full load amps and, and your currents. And um, and it could be that, uh, uh, that, that you are going to have a value that's outside of that table. So good point. Thank you, Mr. Fahey. 
why we got you, buddy. I hope it will be a little less in your next paycheck for that answer. All right. Uh, where are we at? Okay, we're going to move on. Uh, all right, so uh, we're going to talk about the motor start curve. Very important parameter, very important uh, piece of the pie. Uh, the motor start curve. Now, I, I, I hopefully, I mean, depending upon how many people we have here, I think a lot of people that are online have been have been a part of my programs over the last uh, couple few weeks at least, where we talked about a lot of things, and um, you understand what a time current characteristic curve is. I've got current across the bottom, I've got time up the left-hand side, and I can do plot things like uh, overcurrent protective relays and breakers and fuses. Uh, but this is, remember, this is at the very end of that branch circuit. This is my load. This is not a lighting load where you just turn it on and it's on. This is a device that's going to come up to speed. It's going to take time. You have locked rotor amps versus full load amps, and there's a time period from when it transitions from locked rotor amps to full load amps so uh and what i'm showing here is the start curve for a 100 horsepower motor i picked you know a 10 second um a 10 second uh, transition uh, the 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 transition from the locked rotor amps to full load amps is really going to be dependent upon what i'm driving right so if i'm driving a conveyor belt it may take me longer to get that motor up to speed because I've got to get that conveyor belt moving. If I'm driving a fan, it's going to come up to speed very quick. It's going to transition from locked rotor to full load amps very quickly. Uh, now you'll notice, I'm going to get close here. You notice down here in the bottom, we have this diagonal. I mean, if, if a lot of times people don't show this, they just show this curve coming straight down. But in reality, when you first start a motor, I mean, we're talking iron, we're talking coils, lighting loads do have inrush. Good point, Ellie. Good point. Uh, but in any case, this bottom part of this curve, this motor start curve, there's an asymmetrical aspect to that motor on, on first start. A lot of people don't plot that. Um, SKM, I'm not sure uh, if the various software applications, if you're doing, I used to do these by hand and I, I never really plotted that. And then I had a, a PE friend of mine because it made a difference actually. Uh, I, I cut, a, uh, I cut a, uh, a breaker really close to that start curve and it was tripping. And we, um, I couldn't figure out why. I couldn't move it to the right. And we did a profile. We captured the waveform of the start curve and there was a little kick out right down there at the bottom like this and i didn't understand what that was and i learned the hard way that uh, there is an asymmetrical portion of that which can impact uh, the tripping of an overcurrent protective device at least it did in my example and that just could be because i have this big cloud that that lives above me all the time um, but in any case that's your motor start curve and I need to make sure my motor starts. The knee of this curve right here, uh, I could have a transition to full load amps down lower. I could have something that keeps it in there longer. Uh, depending upon the load that I am pushing and driving um, and, um, and the motor itself. So I, will, I can get detailed information on your large motors, on what the load profile is, or what your start curve is. A lot of your smarter, mo smaller motors, you don't necessarily get that, um, uh, that type of level of detail. Um, but, but in any case, this helps you understand that every motor is going to have some sort of a start curve. And in addition to that, they will have a um, thermal damage curve. And what I'm showing here, this is... Um, a lot of times you'll have two, you'll have like, you have this here and you may have another curve that's down like this. And what they, they basically are plotting in that case, you're plotting a cold motor versus a warm motor. Um, your thermal damage curve may shift to the left for, for some of these motors and, and uh, lower currents because it's, it's, it's a running motor. It's hot. Uh, and, um, 
a lower current will uh, will drive uh, uh, will, will could damage that uh, faster. Um, I'm just going to look at some of the comments out on TubeLand here. I I saw this one with uh, Ellie. Thank you, Ellie. Uh, I think it was Ellie. Somebody talked about uh, uh, yes, Ellie Markovic. Uh, uh, lighting loads can have an inrush, and I agree. And and uh, LED lighting. LED loads, um, your HID loads, things like that could have an inrush, uh, an inrush current, and I know that can actually trip uh, uh, circuit breakers as well. And I have a lighting program that I do, and I could probably make a make some time to do that one if I can brush that one off. But yes, you are absolutely right. Uh, SKM slopes the transition, and ETEP has a flat transition. That's true, Henry. Uh, there's a lot of uh, different software applications will plot that curve. Some of them just plot a uh, straight down over and uh, make it look like a little step function. Uh, but uh, uh, SKM gives it a nice transition. But in, and in reality, it's not a step function. Uh, you'll see, uh, like in this case here, uh, we have time in seconds, and I got a find the uh, uh, I got the, the original source for that one if this this curve that you see here is a, a seven horsepower 700 horsepower motor like I said the large motors we get a lot more detailed information for large motors so what you're seeing here is the um, uh, is the acceleration time versus the current so uh, you're Remember, we talked about acceleration and, and that transition from locked rotor amps to full load amps. And this one here uh, actually calls out, and I'm not sure if I have it, but it calls out that the acceleration time, uh, the acceleration time for this is around, uh, at 100% voltage is around 1.3 seconds. At 90% voltage, it's 1.7 seconds. Um, so, and then you have that, th the, the damage and, and usually you don't, you, I, I never did. I never, I can honestly say even, even the medium voltage device, the motors that I've never really plotted the damage curve for a motor uh, in SKM or others. I don't know if anybody else out there has, if you have, I mean, you know, please share that. Um, I, I know I've never, I've never had to plot that. Never got in trouble either. At least uh, I, I wasn't on the job site over the life of that motor either. Uh, but in any case, uh, this is the, for this specific 700 horsepower motor, uh, this is an example report that you could get out of a manufacturer. They'll give you the different uh, start times. They'll give you the, the, the curves for percent of, um, of synchronous speed uh, versus uh, torque, current, power factor, efficiency, and time. So you can get a lot of uh, information and, 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 val and valuable information to help you understand uh, what it's going to take to start that motor, what it's going to take to move that load, and what it's going to take to get all of that done without tripping your overcurrent protective device. Now, uh, what we'll have is a, a code that's typically marked on these motors, and 430.7 tells us that we have to mark the motors and multi-motor equipment um, with a, uh, a KVA per horsepower uh, that, that gives you this one here is a G. Uh, there's the, the nameplate. I, I got a little... For you guys, I got a little... Uh, um, uh, I took a close-up of that. It's uh, your. This is a G cloud. Da, 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 code is uh, is a G. So this tells you that your kilovolt amperes per horsepower is five anywhere from five point six to six point two nine. Now you know a lot of these motors. I'll get data that gives me that information. That may vary from what I see in the code. But as I as I pointed out, there's reasons that we we use these tables instead of the nameplate information. Uh, but I might need, I might want the nameplate information to help me model it better in my SKM or Easy Power or whatever tool that you're using. I may use uh, the actual information to help model it better so I understand how it's going to respond based upon the overcurrent devices that I have given. So multi-speed motors, again, uh, highest speed at which the motor can be started. So your KVA per horsepower is the highest speed. Uh, your constant, uh, except for the constant horsepower, and and this was again. Sometimes your locked rotor amps are going to be your your uh, full load amps are going to be greater uh, when you're in these multi-speed uh, applications. Single-speed motors, 
Uh, again, so how we start these motors makes a difference as well. Y connected, uh, some of these motors will be Y connected during start and then convert back over to a delta. And you've got to understand how they're started because that will impact how you pick your overloads, how you pick uh, other parts and pieces of the uh, of that circuit. So uh, it's important to understand whether it's a Y start or it's a cross the line delta start, etc. And 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 these motors will tell you the nameplates will and and the information you get from the from the manufacturer and whatnot on these motors will will give you that info. Uh, dual voltage motors have a different locked rotor uh, kilovolt amperes per horsepower. And again, this is a dual voltage motor. So I have uh, two thirty. I can run this at two thirty or four sixty. I've got two different full load amps, um, and whatnot. So it's in again. It's a usable at two hundred eight volts. 50 and 60 horsepower rating. So this 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 motor in 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 specific, you'll notice it only says 60 horsepower, uh, and the 60 horsepower is right cheer, right there. That's your 60 horsepower, uh, or 60 hertz, not 60 horsepower. Your 60 hertz. Uh, some motors can be used 50 and 60 hertz, and it tells you in 430.7, uh, 430.7 that. Uh, you have to be marked with a code designating the locked rotor KVA per horsepower on 60 hertz. Just another important detail. Part winding motors. Uh, marked with a code letter designating the locked rotor KVA per horsepower that's based on the locked rotor current for the full winding of the motor. Uh, the motor branch circuit short circuit ground fault protection shall be capable of carrying the starting current of the motor. I, I mean, I, and that's obvious because you can't keep tripping the breaker or opening the fuse uh, because of that starting current. But you can't exceed the, uh, that which is calculated in accordance with 430.52. And this was the table. So when we looked at our 100 horsepower in that, in that example, we take the data from the table in the, in the National Electrical Code. And we um, and we multiply it by these factors. We don't size that overcurrent protective device based upon the nameplate information. Right. So let's talk a little bit about motor insulation. Uh, you have a turn to turn insulation. You have a phase to turn insulation, phase to ground insulation. You've got slot wedges, impregnation with uh, which is binding all of that together. That's that uh, uh, where it solidifies and 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 creates that. Uh, that um, that insulation for everything that's that's that it covers, right? So motor heat is the primary cause of failure uh, of insulation. Uh, it it deteriorates the insulation. It could break down your bearings, etc. Uh, the lubrication inside of that motors inside of the motor. Uh, ten deg a rule of thumb: a ten degree C rise in temperature will cut the insulation life in half. Uh, and and we give. There, there are parameters associated with each of those types. NEMA, uh, MG1, and other reference information will tell us that for a type B motor, my maximum operating temperature that's allowed is 130 or 100, 230 degrees C or 266 degrees Fahrenheit. There, it gives us an allowable temperature rise at full load at 1.0 surface factor of 80 degrees C. And there's an allowable temperature rise at 1.15 at 90 degrees C. Uh, and and uh, and again, this assumes an ambient temperature of 40 degrees C. So that information that's on that nameplate gives you a lot of information with regard to uh, the proper application of that product and from a temperature perspective. And that's important to make sure you don't have insulation breakdown. You got four classes, A, B, F, and H. Uh, I don't know what they did with C, D, E, and G, but uh, they threw that out. Identify the uh, allowable uh, temperature rise. Uh, again, 40 degrees C ambient. Uh, and we just showed you that table, uh, and it's important to understand uh, that you're you're you want to preserve the life of that piece of equipment. And this is why uh, temperature is critical. So we have RTDs on the larger motor, your bigger investment. We're going to have RTDs, different types of temperature sensors, in and around that motor. That's going to give you alarming and triggering and possibly shutting down that motor because of those temperature rises to preserve the integrity of the insulation. Because it may not be a motor failure that contributes to the in, in increased temperature. It could be something with the load that you're driving. 
right? So allowable uh, temperature rise charts. There's class A, B. I just gave you basically this uh, same information. This is just a different way to look at it. Uh, temperature capabilities. Again, the maximum temperature which the installation can be operated to yield an average life of 2.3 years. And and elevation is going to temp. Uh, you know, this is why we say you know your the elevation that you're that you're operating these motors at. All of this impacts um, impacts the uh, the life and the temperature, dissipation of temperature, etc. Uh, there's a hot spot allowance, uh, and then what that it's a point at the center of that motor, uh, motor's windings where the temperature is the highest, right? And there's different classes A, B, F, and, and H. So this one tells us we have a temperature rise at, rise at rated load at 33 degrees C and a temperature rise at the service factor at 43 degrees C. So this motor, we have a lot more information. We have we have, you know, you'll have a lot more information on this 100 horsepower motor than you'll have for a little 30 horsepower motor or a 10 horsepower motor. And you won't have as uh, as much information for this 100 horsepower motor as you'd have for, uh, you know, a 1,000 horsepower motor or some, some larger, huge, big hunk of burning love. So those larger motors are going to give you a lot more data and information to determine uh, your proper motor over, temper over temperature protection. So again, uh, if you're using an adjustable speed drive, you, the drive itself is going to be monitoring temperature because remember we're 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 changing frequencies. We could be changing voltage. Uh, we're doing things to change the speed of that motor to that motor, and because of that, we're going to be running that motor probably at higher temperatures. And and um, variable frequency drives and those types of technologies are going to be keep a close eye on. Um, on all of those conditions. So let's talk about the um, uh, the, the 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 different parts of this uh, of of this circuit and size. Some of these, you know, short circuit protection, 150 to 400 uh, percent for short circuit and ground fault. And that's just for your short circuit protection. That's not your overload. Your overload side sized at 115 to 140 percent for the overload and 125 cent per your branch circuit conductors. And you might say, well, wait a second. How can I have, oh, how am I protecting the conductor if I've got my, my short circuit protection set so high? Uh, you've got to understand that the protection of this circuit is separated now. You're doing the short circuit protection on the overcurrent device and you're doing the overload protection uh, based on another type of device. Both of those together offer complete protection for that circuit and we're going to hopefully help you understand that once we get into the curves so you have the full load current uh, which is a covered in 430.6 ampacity and motor rating you have the full load current and rating of the motor comes from tables 430 247 to 250 and we talked about this earlier so i'm going to use the tables to size my conductors my short circuit protection my ground fault protection my controllers and my disconnects and the reason is if I change that motor out and it has a different full load amps, but the same horsepower, I'm not going to change my infrastructure out. I don't have to change my short circuit protection, my conductors, because I size things for another motor that was uh, the same horsepower, but a lower full load amps. And now I have another motor that's a same horsepower, but a higher full load amps. But I do the overloads based upon the nameplate ratings, because that's going to be more catered to the motor itself. And again, you can't forget about uh, the exception in 430.6A1, uh, uh, A1, uh, talking about the tables and the exception number two. So remember that from Mr. Fahey. All right, so conductor size at 125% of the tables in 430.22. So uh, there's the language in 430.22 for a single motor, and that's what I have here. So what I do is I go to that table. I, I and we did this as part of the question. I went. I found 124 amps for full load amps on a 100 horsepower motor for a 460 volt motor. I multiply that by 1.25. Um, I get 155 amps. Is that right? Just double check. Oh yeah, this is the conductor, right? 1.25. Uh, 1.1. I was changing numbers last night. I just want to make sure that, yep, 155. So I can size that for a 2-odd conductor, a 75-degree C column, 
uh, the amp capacity for that is 175 amps and I don't use the motor nameplate for that. So that gives me my conductor. And if I look and now what I've done to my protection scheme is I've added now the conductor damage curve and I have my motor start curve. And I know uh, from a coordination perspective, I need to protect this motor. I mean, I need to make, let this motor run. And what I'm not showing on here is the motor damage is probably somewhere up here. Okay. Uh, so I have my motor damage, which is, is somewhere up in this area. I've got my conductor damage curve. So I'm going to need an overcurrent device uh, that's probably an overload that's going to be somewhere in this region. And then an instantaneous, uh, say if it's a breaker, somewhere that protects this from short circuit and overloads and uh, from short circuits. And I'm going to need the overload to make sure that I protect that conductor. But I got to let this motor run. Run, Forrest, run. Right, so that's the con conductor, and that's an insulation damage, right? So I have a copper conductor or aluminum conductor, and I've got it uh, encapsulated with uh, you know, with PV or with rubber insulator, whatever it is I'm insulating, and, I'm, and that damage curve uh, is the breakdown of uh, to ensure that you don't break down the insulation on the conductor. So again, I got to enable that motor to start. I have got to uh, pick my short circuit and my ground fault protection and all those components. I'm going to follow the code and I'm going to show you what uh, what the code based on the NEC requirements, how I pick those overcurrent devices and what it looks like on the trip curves. Uh, so again, 43052, uh, don't expect the motor brand circuit conductor to be protected at or below their ampacities. The overcurrent protection for the conductors of the motor circuits are provided by a combination of the motor branch circuit, short circuit, and ground fault device in conjunction with the overload protective relay. So, you know, 43052 uh, points us back to 240.4G, uh, which helps us understand that whole concept that we're going to be doing that overcurrent protection based upon 430, uh, which is going to be split between two types of devices, more than likely. So brand circuit conductors. Uh, con circuit conductors have an impacity not less than 125% of the rated input current to the power conversion equipment this is in 430.122 for adjustable speed drives. So when I throw a drive in a picture, and I don't go into a lot of detail on drives, but the but how I do things from sizing my conductors and sizing things and providing protection is going to change because I've got this, this thing, this black box that's in the middle that's that's separating those output conductors that are going to the motor and I'm doing some funky things over there. I'm changing frequencies, I'm changing voltage potential, um, things like that that are occurring and I'm doing my own protection on the secondary. But on the line side of that, I'm sort of I'm sort of shielding my, my power distribution system from what's going on on the secondary. Um, so I have to size my conductors and things differently uh, when I'm using adjustable speed drives. All right. Uh, again, included. So there's details on that in 430.22. Let's talk about our overcurrent protection selection. So we've picked the conductor. We've got our motor starting curve. Um, so short circuit and ground fault protection uh, is based on the full load amps in the tables, not what's on the nameplate. So again, remember, we had that 124 amps for that 100 horsepower motor. I'm not going to use the 1.25. That's what we used for the conductor. <clears throat> um, and 430.52 has the multipliers. And if I look at uh, the table, 430.52, I am looking at, uh, uh, for a polyphase motor, other than wound rotors, I, I have a non, I have, I've got four options. I can use a non-time delay fuse, a dual, not a dual, element fuse, an instantaneous trip breaker, or an inverse time breaker. And if I do the math for each of those, I can go up to a 372 amp non-time delay fuse. I can only do a 207, up to a 217 amp uh, dual element time delay fuse. But again, I, you know, I'm not going to give you a 217 amp fuse, uh, but uh, you know, you have to, you have to either pick that next higher or, or I went to a 200 amp fuse better I, i'm i'm more interested in providing closer protection in any case so uh an instantaneous trip breaker i can go up to 800 amps uh which is huge right or a 900 800 percent which is 992 amps and you say man a day i'm gonna have a nine i'm gonna have a, over a i'm gonna have a thousand amp breaker on this little hundred house horsepower motor that's insane uh it's not gonna provide protection 
And then you have your inverse time breaker, 310 amps. Let's take a look. Uh, there is my short circuit protection. This is a dual element fuse, and I have picked a 175 amps. So I put a 175 amp fuse in here. It, and, and what I like, what I love about this is, um, what I like about this is, I'm just going to give you guys in two bland a full shot of this. What I like is, uh, you can see how the shape of of this fuse curve ooh, you know it gives me a nice little it almost follows the contour of this uh initial startup of that motor so i i don't have to worry about the initial start for lock rotor amps even the asymmetrical i've got good separation there and now i i chose 10 seconds but as you as we just learned um the the start time is going to vary depend upon the load and it and the start time i mean 10 seconds is a good default number to use um you're probably going to go faster you'll definitely go faster than 10 seconds if it's a say a fan of some sort again it depends upon the motor that you're or it depends upon the load that you're driving and there's a calculation method to figure out the knee of that curve um but in any case, um, you know this this 175 amp dual element fuse fits nicely. It gives me uh, it gives me uh, short circuit protection on my conductor. It lets this motor run and it'll give me very good fast acting short circuit protection for uh, for that motor. And 430.36 says where uh, where used for motor overload protection, a fuse shall be inserted in each unground. So I can use the fuse for overload protection under certain conditions. And uh, but I have to have it in each ungrounded conductor and also in the grounded conductor uh, if the supply system is a three wire, three phase AC uh, circuit with one conductor ground. So, um, no, so that's my fuse protection. Here is my motor circuit protection, my MCP. As you'll notice, it does not have the thermal. This is just an instantaneous trip circuit breaker, so there's no thermal capabilities inside this breaker. Uh, and that's an important distinction because you can't use this breaker as a um, as a circuit protection for, say, a conductor uh, for overloads because there is no overload capability in there. And it's listed in this way that it's used in combination with uh, other specific components. And that's the way it's uh, it's got a um, you it's a recognized part component. So. That's basically what that looks like for short circuit protection only. And I and, and it can be adjustable. I can move that um, uh, in in different. Uh, this one here is, uh, that's a 350. That you'll notice, and it's, if I, let me just go between the two. You'll notice if you look down at the bottom right here. Geez, oh man. Having troubles with my touchpad. So if you look right down here, the separation in between where that cants over for this one, which is programmed to go at 1560 instantaneous, this one's 1750. So that um, uh, you can adjust that instantaneous and move it uh, higher. But uh, the goal would be, obviously, to get it as close as I can to that motor start curve uh, without going, without uh, you know, giving it too much room to to have you know uh, a problem from a short this is just providing short circuit protection so i i, I just i want to make sure you want to make sure that your fault the further into this breaker curve the higher th that you are into that the faster that device is going to trip it's an inverse time over current protect uh, uh, the inverse time device so i want my fault currents to be well into the instantaneous region of this breaker so the 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 further to the left i can move this without actually tripping on startup the better off i am from a, a pr protection perspective because it'll trip very fast so the overload now that's the short circuit protection the overload protection is sized based upon the nameplate data and not those tables so and in 430.32 continuous doty mode duty Doty, duty, duty motors. Uh, a tells us more than one horsepower. Motors with a marked service factor of 1.15. So there's where your service factor comes into play, right? So you're going to get 
uh, an adjustment factor. If your motors are with a marked service factor of 1.515 or greater is at 125%, all other motors are at 115%. So I'm letting you uh, increase the um, um, increase my overload size because I'm accounting for that 1.15 in this 430.32a uh, table. So I'm using 1.25 because my service factor is 1.15. And that tells me I'm at 148.75 amps on my overload. Now, when I pick my overloads and my NEMA size starter, so my NEMA size starter is going to be picked based upon horsepower. It's not going to be based upon uh, um, uh, the full load amps. I'm going to pick my NEMA size starter based on, on horsepower. So for my for a 100 horsepower motor, I'm in a NEMA size 4. And then I uh, will pick the overload uh, based upon those settings, and I plot that on my curve. So I've just now I'm showing the overload, which if you think about from a from a thermal capability of the motor, that motor curve has a similar shape, and it's probably way up here somewhere. Uh, but the motor overloads are shaped to be similar to uh, the motor thermal capabilities. And I'm going to plot that, and my key is here that I don't want the knee of this to trip the on the thermal. So, uh, you know, and this is the value of the, your larger motors when you have a very good, accurate motor start curve. On your smaller motors, you're not going to have a start curve. You're going to basically follow the NEC, just like transformers. You know, we plotted the curves yesterday for a 112.5 kVA transformer. You're probably not going to do that on every 112.5 kVA transformer. You're going to blindly just, you know, pick what the code permits you to pick and uh, and then and run with it. If you did this on the, on this motor and for some reason this motor was driving a load that had a longer uh, uh, transition time than 10 seconds and pushed into this it would trip you would make an adjustment and uh, you would increase the size of that overload uh, uh, up less than what the maximum is and as long as that motor runs you're good to go um, and you wouldn't probably do an analysis like this unless it's a very expensive motor but i'm showing you uh you know for this 100 horsepower motor i'm giving you a best guess at a start curve at a 10 second uh, transition time, uh, there's your overload and there's your conductor damage. So I'm protecting my conductor from, from uh, thermal overload. And uh, I've contact, I'm protecting the uh, instantaneous. With the instantaneous, I'm protecting it from short circuits. Uh, again, so I, I, you know it lets the motor start. Uh, motors are marked with, uh, okay, so this is the selection of your overload device. Uh, where the sensing element are setting. So there is a, per, a permission or an allocation to let you uh, go above. So if you if you are running into the knee of that curve because of the the load that you're starting and it's not and it's not transitioning as fast as what you'd like or what you would hope for, um, then <clears throat> then you have uh, the ability in 430.32 uh, C. I'm just going to open my code book because I got uh, it's, it's overwritten there. Sorry about that. So remember, 430 to 32 is continuous duty motors. And C deals with selection of the overload device. And it tells us that where you're sensing or setting of that or sizing of the overload selected in accordance with A1 uh, and B1 is not sufficient to start the motor to carry that load, higher size sensing elements are incrementing. Uh, are permitted and and then these are the numbers you you're permitted to go up to 140 percent for the 115 so i can move that up to 140 percent if i wanted to um, and uh, so this is uh, what i did here again this is uh, uh so this just basically shows you both overcurrent protection so you have the short circuit protection and your overload i've got my 175 amp fuse i have my uh, overloads uh, uh, set up and I'm showing here that the combination of both of those are providing overcurrent protection, short circuit and ground fault uh, protection and overload protection over uh, yeah overload protection for the motor and the conductor. So I'm getting I've got my conductor is protected and 
I've got very good protection on this motor, and that's all based, ba picked based upon the National Electrical Code uh, requirements. There's my motor circuit protector. That shows you that your overload is, is occurring by this uh, overload, and your short circuit is being offered by uh, the uh, motor circuit protector. And both of those together give you almost a, you know, uh, it, it looks very similar to a... Uh, a thermal magnetic circuit breaker without the uh, uh, the thermal characteristics being built into the breaker. It's being split between two devices. So this is a thermal magnetic circuit breaker, a 350 amp uh, uh, breaker set to trip at 1750, the instantaneous, and and uh, with the overload. So uh, you know it, it, the overloads. It, you can see the difference between uh, these two. I can I can fine tune my overload protection with that instead of la relying on uh, the longer clearing times in that region of that breaker. So the, you know, ad having a motor overload protection is, uh, does a lot for us. Now, uh, I I've said this numerous times during this discussion that the more investment that you have in the motor, the more protection you're going to have uh, on, on a motor. Uh, so, it's it's no different than than anything. You know, the more the more we invest in in any type of uh, product, we're going to be providing more protection. So what I did was, I took uh, on this same motor, I I plotted uh, uh, a relay. I just took a, an M, our MP three thousand relay, uh, which uh, you know has a lot of features. It would be an extreme overkill for this 100 horsepower motor, but I'm just demonstrating a point. On your medium voltage motors uh, and other larger motors where, you, again, you have a much higher, bigger investment, you're going to be employing uh, relays that offer a lot of different capabilities. This device will give you I squared T overload. When I say I squared T, uh, it's this portion of the curve. That's an I squared T curve. Um, it'll give you locked rotor protection, and and the numbers are relay symbols, are relay numbers that that you might see on a drawing, a 49, 51, a 50, 51 at your overcurrent instantaneous. Uh, negative sequence uh, is your for phase imbalance is your 46. So you know these are all of the, the different types of protection. You'll have uh, the ability to bring those temperature sensors in here, and 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 in some cases for motor protection relays will actually, based upon the temperatures, will adjust on the fly these trip curves and move them around based upon the temperatures that the, the motor is being ex is experiencing. So you you know in some cases we've plotted in the past a, a curve that will make sure that you don't have a locked rotor and and uh, and and provide a almost like a downshoot here for uh, for motor protection. A different additional protection you know, the ideal thing would be is to be able to take a, a relay and actually mimic this start curve as close as you can so that if you go outside of the tolerances you open and and again the the the, the larger that motor the more investment that you have the more money you're going to spend on relays like this that can operate on currents They'll take average currents. They'll actually uh, memorize the starting curve and be able to recognize whether or not you go outside of the tolerances. Uh, temperature, and it'll modify uh, the based on temperatures, and it'll give you the last so many starts. We Our relays will be able to show you the motor starting curve um, after a few starts, and you can see how that's changing over time. You can spot bearing wear and things of that nature. Now you get into uh, using motor controllers as your overload. So you're 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 going to see more and more where uh, they they want to combine as much of that technology into one as, that they can uh, because uh, it's better. Uh, you know, again, we're worried about uh, uh, worried about cost and footprint, et cetera. And so for your smaller motors and things of that nature, they're going to integrate more of the protection with the overloads, with the controllers. Um, and, and the only time you, you know, the, the things you have to worry about there are uh, whether or not you're, you're, um, you're protecting for short circuit current ratings and things like that. 
Now, uh, 430.124 talks about uh, adjustable speed drives and, uh, you know, again, doing more inside of the equipment. Uh, and I don't, again, I'm, I'm not doing a deep dive on ASG. Now let's talk about multiple motor feeders. So now I have, uh, I have four of those motors, okay? Because I, I, I basically created a little curve for each of those. And I've got to think about how do I size uh, all of the independent uh, individual overloads and individual short, individual short circuit protection, but then how do I size that feeder circuit? and feeder overcurrent protective device that's feeding a uh, motor control center or some sort of equipment that has multiple motors. Uh, what 430.25 talks about multiple, multi-motor and combination load equipment and talks about the impacity of the conductor supplying multi-motor and combination equipment. Um, and it tells you that you can't, you have to, uh, shall not be less than the minimum circuit impacity marked on the equipment. So if there is a, if it's a, a combined unit, where you have multiple motors, they'll do the math for you and tell you this is your minimum circuit ampacity for this equipment. Um, and the, or uh, if it's not factory wired and and in and, and you don't have the individual, and if you have the individual nameplates, then you can do your own sizing of that feeder based upon 430.72. So you have several motors or a motor and other loads. Uh, so you have you have a conductor supplying several motors or motors and other loads so have an impacity not less than the sum of each of the following. 125% of the full load current rating of the highest rated motor. In our case, we have four 100 horsepower motors, so you pick one of them. Uh, they're all equal. Sum of the full load current ratings of the other motor. So you take one and at 125% and then you add, just add the others. And then if you have non-continuous and continuous loads, you either add them at 100% or 125%, right? Piece of cake. Easy as pie. So there's our 100 uh, horsepower motor, 124 amps. So if I take the, the, the one of those motors at 125%, uh, that would be 1.25 times 124. There's my 155. I, I add the full load current ratings of the other motors uh, at 124 times, times 3 because I've got a total of four motors. Uh, one's at 125%, the other's at uh, straight, their full load amps. I don't have any non-continuous motor loads. I don't have any continuous non-motor loads. So my total amps is 572. And my conductor has to have an impacity not less than 572 amps. And I go, and again, I leverage table 310.16. I hate picking out conductors because every time I do, I have someone in the audience who says, well, I would never have done that. I would have just done three three odds because I had that on the truck. Or, uh, well, I would have just done one 1,000 MCM. I don't know. I don't care what recipe you use. As long as your lugs can handle it, uh, you pick the combination that works, and that's the conductor that you would be placing as my uh, feeder that's going to those. And then you would protect that at its impacity uh, based on 240 and, uh, and you know, six, probably a 600 amp breaker feeding uh, or fuse feeding those, uh, those motors. Hopefully that's clear. Uh, now, and then you get into part seven, motor controllers. You know, the rating of the motor controller, again, um, you have horsepower ratings, you have circuit breakers, a multi-case switch, so a horsepower rating, a controller other than inverse time circuit breakers and multi-case switches, I have to have a uh, horsepower rating at the application voltage, not lower than the horsepower rating of the motor. So you need to know the horsepower and the voltage to be able to pick those contactors and that equipment. Uh, the the outside of 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 that you've got to think about the short circuit current rating, and the short circuit current rating is going to be a critical part because you don't want that to happen, right? So in this case, we short circuited this downstream, uh, and the components inside cannot handle the amount of current that's passing through it, uh, and and the and the magnetic forces. So I had an unattended rapid disassembly in the field and I covered short circuit current ratings and fault currents uh, in one of my previous classes. So I'm not going to regurgitate that. Uh, check out my YouTube uh, on short circuit currents and you'll see more about short circuit current ratings and, and uh, helping you understand uh, let throughs and things like that. One of the questions that we had was type one versus type two. Uh, type one uh, permits damage to the equipment. Type two protection is no damage 
to that starter. So you have a much faster acting overcurrent device. And the Fuse guys love to talk about Type 2 protection because the Fuse is a uh, is one of the best uh, tools used uh, to ensure that level of performance in your motor uh, controllers. Uh, for the purpose of the article, a controller is any switch or device that is normally used to start and stop a motor by making and breaking the motor circuit current. So, you know, you can have a, uh, a controller and, and there's a vid good video on, and I'll put a link to it uh, on our, um, our website from the uh, Experience Center uh, that, that talks about uh, contactors. And once I put a contactor in combination with overload, now I'm into a motor controller type of environment. Uh, where I can start and stop a motor, etc. Uh, you have to m uh, mark that controller with the, uh, the the manufacturer's name, the voltage, the horsepower rating, and the short circuit current rating, and other uh, data to properly indicate the application which is suitable suited. And that's in, in in the general requirements in Article 430, in specifically 430.8, um, requires horsepower rating controllers or circuit breaker or multi case switch. So I can still use a molded case, a molded case circuit breaker or a molded case switch uh, without a horsepower rating. Uh, so there's your motor controllers. Again, uh, you know, you have, uh, you have a single pulse switch. I don't have to open both of those. Um, I don't need to open all of those conductors. I'm just there to start and stop that motor. Uh, I can build that in. This is a UL508 mechanical type of device. Uh, it's a on off switch. Again, you're going to be using these in combination with other components to provide uh, that control. Uh, the short circuit current rating of this equipment is going to be critical. That's why, and that's going to be dependent upon your overcurrent device upstream. Uh, the location of that disconnecting means, 430.101, general requirements requires a disconnecting mean capable of disconnecting motor and controllers from the circuit. Uh, it has to be within sight of that controller, with sight of the motor. Uh, so, you know, that's an important aspect, and that's a safety aspect to, to be able to, to uh, isolate the, all of that equipment for our electrical uh, uh, workers. I'm reaching up there to change the slides, and I don't have to. So there's your motor controller. There's your motor disconnect. Uh, I've disconnected. So if it's on the other side of a wall, again, it has to be, it's required. Uh, it must be located within sight of the controller. Uh, the disconnecting means for the motor shall not be required if uh, A and B is met, if it's impractical or additional uh, increased hazards, uh, or if you're in a supervised industrial installation. So, uh, in you know those uh, those cases, you're you you could have a lockout tag out on on the in the motor control center, etc. All right, um, ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. keep going. Uh, UL98 disconnect switch. Again, it's uh, disconnecting means for that motor. It's um, if it's horsepower rated, it can be used as a motor controller. It can you can have fusible, you can non unfu non fusible. Uh, the fuses could be a, as part of the separate. Uh, you know, you you may have a disconnect switch that uh, is a standard disconnect switch, and uh, but but it'll specify the short circuit current rating based upon an upstream overcurrent protective device. I call that our spotter. If you want to uh, take a look at one of the other videos that I have out on the uh, Eaton videos.eaton.com, I think is the URL for that. Um, all right, so this table here is a nice, a nice little comparison. Uh, it it uh, gives us uh, what can be used in combination with other components, like for like a circuit breaker. I can use that as a motor circuit and controller disconnect. I can use a, a circuit breaker as a motor branch short circuit and uh, ground fault protection uh, when, uh, if it's a slash rated voltage, limited to solidly grounded Y systems only. Uh, I can use that multi case circuit breaker as my overload protection. Uh, but again, I quite often I can't size that multi case circuit breaker, thermomagnetic circuit breaker, close enough to give us overload protection because I'll end up tripping on um, inrush currents. Um, where else can I use that? I can use it as a motor, motor obviously as a motor disconnect. Um, so, and this, this sort of table gives you an outline of where you can use it. Uh, from a YouTube perspective, you could pause this and read through it. Uh, this table and more 
is available in our uh, booklet called Selecting Protective Devices. Uh, I'll put a link to this down below the YouTube channel uh, in the notes so that you have access to this. It's a, it's a great uh, resource for your electronic library. Uh, from a single phasing perspective, you know, you're, there's a lot of reasons why you will single phase a motor. I could have, I could take one of my phases out because of the, the you know, again, I can hit a pole, I can have a, 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 a something upstream take out one of my phases. I could have def, uh, defective contacts, I could have uh, a recloser issue, I can have something upstream uh, cause a problem in that, that will single phase the motor. And what, what will typically happen is your the, the distribution of currents will, dis, will, will uh, because I'm single phasing, one of those phases is going to see an overload and my overload protection will take that circuit out. Um, so that's, you know, again, uh, an important thing to remember that no matter what, for whatever reason, um, single phasing is not an issue with motors because I have overload protection and uh, that will protect and provide protection for my equipment. Uh, if I have a secondary side, I can have uh, damage on my motor starter contact. I can have a, 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 a burned open uh, relay from, let's say, a heater element. A damaged switch, I can have uh, a single, a, a, one of my fuses could have opened. There are a lot of different uh, things that will happen on the secondary side. And, and whenever that happens, again, you're going to see an overload happen in the other two phases uh, when an, a single phasing occurs on the uh, load side, on the motor side of the business. Uh, on uh, in the other condition, I had a, a single phase on the source side, so I still had you know three phase currents going, but one of those phases was going was going into overload. In this case, I'm going to have one of those phases, uh, or both of those two of the other phases go into overload. So because I'm using overload protection and overload readers, uh, uh, relays, heater elements, things of that nature, I'm going to be protecting that motor from overloads. Uh, electronic motor overload protection, uh, again, the more expensive the motor, the more protection I'm going to be providing on that motor. I'm going to pick up any, I'm going to have negative sequence. Uh, and if I have a very expensive motor, I can have negative, negative sequence relays. I'll have RTDs in there. All of those things um, add up for, the, for your smaller motors. You're going to be, uh, you know, you're, you're relying on your overload heater elements, etc. All right, so let's take a look. I'm going to take a look at the. I've been ignoring chat um, for a while now. I'm going to get on chat. Let's take a look at my tubers. My tubers. Um, uh, piping engineers wants to share something. I'm going to. I'm going to share that one. There's piping designs. I'm not following. There's no thermal protection within the circuit breaker. Uh, so I'm not following how there is no thermal protection within the circuit breaker. How there is no thermal protection in the circuit breaker is because we didn't put it in. So motor circuit protectors don't have any overload. And, you, and, and they're listed uh, specifically. I have one behind me on the shelf. Now this is our, uh, we have a motor HMCP and... Uh, it's this what I'm looking at here is a series C device. It's uh, uh, it's uh, got a it's got a UL recognized I believe label on it. It's yeah, it's a UR you know UL recognized component for an assembly. You're not going to put this in a in a in a, uh, a branch circuit and provide uh, protection for um, for a branch circuit because there's no thermal overloads inside this breaker. Uh, does the starting curve of a motor change if I had liquid rotor starter? <sighs> liquid rotor starter, Jose, man, woo! Um, you're going to have a motor starting curve. If you throw liquid on it, oh, you got problems, buddy. Uh, a lighting session would be great. We're going to do it, Ellie. We're going to get you that lighting session. SKM slope, so transition ETEP has a flap. So no more on that one. Let's take a look at the chat on WebEx. Let's see what's going on on WebEx. All right. Uh, would you post the PDH link, please? I have a meeting. I leave the meeting. Oh, uh, yeah. I'm going to well, leaving in five minutes. Yes, I'm going to post that right now. Uh, well, and thanks everybody out there on the